Watson, welcome to Booktopia. Thank you, Carol. I feel like I've discovered a whole new side of you with this book. I think I always thought of you as a city slicker because I think of you primarily as a speech writer for Canberra politicians. And so I didn't know the bush side of you, but obviously that's the essence of you. It's the core of you, isn't it? Well, maybe I would like to think of myself as a terribly sort of you know, sophisticated urban creature, but um, I don't think you ever get it out of your system if you grow up in, um, and that may not be you know, anything particular about the Australian bush. I think if you, if you, if you grow up wandering around the hillsides and following cows and yelling at dogs and throwing stones at chooks and things, that, all that sort of stays recorded in your mind and your muscle memory and, and all the rest. And when I couldn't think of a way to start this book in the end, I just decided I would start, despite a, a long standing aversion to the thought of writing autobiographically, I thought, well, this is the best way to begin because if I thought about the countryside, I thought of all those you know, 147 acres on which I grew up about half of them vertical or near to it. And all the smells with which we seem to remember so many things. But most of all, the, you know, the, the people in motion, you know, my father and my mother and my grandmother and the rest, they you know, have a particular gait and did particular things. And uh, when I say gait, I mean with an AI. And how different is that bush that you remember from that era from the bush that you live in now? entirely different and one of the things that's most different about it is that we never called it the bush you know the, the bush was a primitive state which we had left behind and which we continued to fight back because the old remnants of the forest kept growing back the bracken and the burrs and the um, and of course the exotics like the thistles and ragwort and all his hideous things and the rabbits and the foxes and all that stuff, who lived in the rubbish which made it all the more sort of evil and to be rid of. So, you know, farming was a kind of cleansing process up to a point and I think it wouldn't be going too far to say that it also you know, was, was held to cleanse the soul as well. Um, keeping the place clean and the rubbish off it was rather like, you know, personal bodily evacuation I think in some ways. It was, very, it was a strong Puritan streak went through. Mm -hmm. But the bush never, we never said it was the bush. The bush was what had been there once, and not very long ago. And our forefathers had cleared that away. The bush I live in now is called the bush, yet it's only, it's, you know, it's occupied mainly by commuters, city commuters. And it's rather rubbishy regrowth forest, full of weeds, no one worries about, blackberries and broom and all that sort of thing foxes, rabbits, the same old things. Mm. Um, and people so close to Melbourne will refer themselves to themselves as living in the bush. Um, well, that's all right, I don't mind. They can tell what they, they like, but it's a different kind of life altogether. But it is a kind of sentimentalising of the bush, and you avoid that so well in, the, in this book. You're so unsentimental and, and unflinching about um, what we've done to the land. Um, and I'm just wondering what you think are the greatest myths that we're still carrying with us about this so-called bush? Well, that's the big question. And, and I don't know that the book entirely answers it. I don't know that anybody can. But um, I think that, that probably it's, you know, it, it is the big story of Australia. Um, I mean, the, the Americans and the Argentinians and the South Africans were all New World societies and they carried on frontier myths into their post-frontier phases. But I think here it's been stronger, possibly because, in a way, we are so few and, the, and the, we haven't really evolved a story to compete with it. If I can give you an example of how strong it is, when I was working in a Prime Minister's office, some people will recall that we raised the question of what sort of flag Australia should have. This created sort of a national kind of upheaval and paroxysms and anxiety. But 
it was good for school teachers who obviously asked all their kids to draw Australian flags as a school project, and hundreds of them found their way to the Prime Minister's office, were sent in, and we had them up on the wall. And the vast majority were simple depictions of the bush, <laughs> a gum tree, or green and blue for the bush in the sky, sometimes with Ayers Rock in it. In one case, Bob Hawke standing on Ayers Rock, which we like to put up just so Paul would see it. Um, there were none of Paul standing on his rock. <laughs> and um, there were Hawking sort of standing there like this. And um, we actually spoke to the people who were interested in flag. I think, I think they're called vexillologists or something. And they said, well, this is the odd thing about Australia, that, we, that all Australian flag designs, with very few exceptions, come up as the bush. We're a tree or a kangaroo or an emu or whatever. And yet, we, you know, most Australians wouldn't know one end of a kangaroo from another mm. or how the bush works or could identify five Australian native plants. Or survive there for any length of time. Uh, absolutely. No, there are exceptions. You know, there's, there is the, the phenomenon of the grey nomads and the blokes who like to drive their four-wheel drives through dust and so on. But we are a highly urbanised society. Um, but when asked what the country is, we're likely to say a gum tree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is a, this is takes some explaining. I, I, I don't know quite how you do it, but I think it's because, in a way, maybe because as a federation we're rather you know dispersed and strong urban legends haven't really haven't really developed. But we're more likely to make a hero of R. M. Williams than we are of any Nobel Prize winning scientist or any author or anyone else. There's a kind of melancholy that um, pervades a lot of the book because a lot of the stories are stories of loss and misery and struggle but there is one part of the book where you're really having a lot of fun which is with the description of modern day gerildery and how it has, to use a word that I think you despise, leveraged mm. its history mm. and particularly the way um, uh, an architect has designed the new police station. I was just wondering whether you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, well, it showed a, a fair bit of wit, the architect. Um, well, uh, you know, Ned Kelly went to gerildery, of course, and, and held the town up for a couple of days. And a few years ago, it seems, uh, the town was struggling like so many Australian country towns. And, and they must have got in a team of consultants and they said, well, the thing to leverage here is not John Monash, who'd lived there for a while and was a very worthy citizen, um, but Ned Kelly, who'd been there for a few days and robbed the joint. So Ned's everywhere in Gerilda. He's stuck up on the roof of all the buildings, including the bakery. <laughs> it seems, I don't know whether he's stealing the tarts or he's, 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 he's defending them, it's hard to say. But there, and of course he never wore his helmet at Gerald, but that doesn't matter, he's got the helmet on. How else would we know him? He'd just be another bearded Victorian. But, and then of course the, um, and you can take tours of this little town and see where he did this and where Joe Byrne and Ned wrote the Gerildry letter, which of course led to Peter Carey's novel and you know, the whole, there's a great long tale attached to that. But the, um, there, the police station, I mean, Ned hated the police, and he shot three of them at Stringy Bark Creek. And, but there, the police station is designed on a Kelly motif, and <laughs> this is odd. It could only happen in Geraldry, <laughs> I suspect. It is delicious. <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. But, I mean, a lot of those towns are uh, right about it a bit. I mean, the, there's a sort of kitsch element to to, you know, when, I suppose once you start leveraging anything, that is instant kitsch. Um, and they need it, and I, you know, I spent 48 hours there, which isn't very long to write about it, I suppose. But um, uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, it's, it is kitsch, but then what do you expect it to be? You know, genuinely dying, or, you know, authentically dead, or, or do you want it to be a town that sort of continues somehow? And um, and it, uh, it does it. I remember it had a, on the old Bank of New South Wales, it had in sort of old world lettering, the old Bank of New South Wales, and elegant, the elegant Victorian or something, which, as if it was impossible to ever be elegant again. 
Yes, yes, you and see that, I love didn't that. have to look very far to see that this was true. <laughs> I have to ask you, John, um, the book is very masculine in its content and, and obviously in its perspective. You do write about the figure of the drover's wife, but where are the other women in the bush? Well, it's a good question, but I, I, it's, it's, it's a fact of our life, which I think we're, our national life, which I think we're still uncovering. Um, that the legends of the bush are male, and if you want to have mateship as your as your sort of as your great you know mantra of Australian life, well then you have to say, well, okay, well, fifty percent of the population is enough, um, which seems to me entirely mad, um, <laughs> and I don't know how long it's going to go on. I thought it was dead. I mean, it's a curious thing. When I was growing up, we didn't talk about mateship. It was just nonsense. I mean, we never. I don't think we called each other mate. Mate is, mateship sort of made this great comeback, like we're some kind of Taliban or something here. I mean, what's going on? It's very odd, and and yet it fights on. And and if, you know, when Julia Gillard, for instance, recently made the speech about the miso the famous or notorious, depending on your point of view, misogyny speech, it still rankles with so many Australian men. I saw John Howard the other day. You know, somewhere it said. Was an outrage and a terrible mistake she made. Why? We are. We are. This isn't a misogynistic society, and so long as we have mateship as a sort of national value, well then it'll remain so. Now, the bush carries this on. I mean, I think you know, if you take the moment at which the legend is born, it's the 1890s. Um, you know, let's say 1890 to 1910. There's the Bulletin School. There's Charles Bean's investigation of, goes out into Western New South Wales and discovers this new Australian figure. He's a man. Among the great writers of that period were a number of women whose works these days ring truer than any of the men in an unmythic way. The Barbara Bagans and mm. Henry Andrew Richardson's and Tasma and these people. And they have a very different view of what the Australian bush really meant for women and what these men were really like including what these, these, these sainted swagmen were like they were frightening people many of them and if you find God knows what mental illnesses they suffered from or a lot of the ones I found were actually running from brutal fathers mm. terrible family conditions and just spent their life on the road in flight from the superego, it seemed to me. Um, and made up, in a classic way, you know, heroic versions of their father's late in life to sort of compensate for some God knows how many layers of guilt and resentment or whatever else they were feeling. So it's a very complex story. And in a way, the maleness of the bush, I think, is, a, is part of the classic, you know, is the lying part of the myth. You know, the untrue part, the silence that descended. I mean, I was amazed reading Mary Durack, again, that, that wonderful you know, Kings in Grass Castles, which has sold countless copies through generations. And in there, she talks very frankly about what was the dark side of the Australian frontier legend. This has all been forgotten, but mm. she says, you know, the policy in Northern Australia was they must all be killed by bullet or by bait, she said. But no one ever says anything. The silence descended. So, in a way, and Ernestine Hill, who was a sort of, you know, a um, terrifically popular Australian um, myth maker in a way, but nevertheless, you know, writes with brutal frankness about what the dark side was and what the, the amount of brutality that, it, that occurred. You would have to, you know, you use the word with caution, but if, 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 if genocide is a policy of extermination, well, that was, that was what it was. I mean, one diarist writes, the work of extermination goes silently on. So if you write the women out of the history, and that's really what happened, I mean, in, in the the Bulletin was a man's magazine. The women writers didn't get a look in. They were all pushed away at the point of federation when the country, it's all formed at once. And then Anzac follows 
which is vindication of Charles Bean's discovery of this man who will be a great fighter, much like the Elizabethan sea rovers, he said, you know, as they were the most loyal to Elizabeth, so these would be the most loyal to the empire, and they were. And at that point, it's a very bad 25 years for women. And they never really find their way back in, into the game until yeah. much later. So, finally, Dawn, I mean, a lot of the book um, concerns itself with the fact that you say that the bush is half dead and doesn't really resemble the bush of 150 years ago, that we will never see the bush the way it once was. What can we do? What can present custodians of the bush such as it is, such as there is left of it, what can we do to look after this properly? This is both a good news story and a bad news. I mean, it, it won't, the destruction is fantastic. I, I, I thought I knew, uh, had an idea. I mean, I, I grew up on a farm that, from which a mighty forest had only recently been cleared. My, I grew up with the legends of pioneers. They were my grandparents and great-grandparents. They cleared a very similar forest, the Mount Nash Forest. So you were sort of aware that this was, this had only just happened. And my mother would talk about what it used to be like, being able to hear a lyrebird, and then that, mm. the last lyrebird she heard was around 1930, when out of poverty the farmers gave permission to have their gullies cleared for the new paper mill, and they took everything. So, and you find many, many examples, often written by women, in fact more often than not. Men rarely wrote down how much they loved the bush that they were clearing, but women often wrote it down. After a while you begin to get very irritated, you think, well, why, why did you think that you had this right to clear everything, you know? You find descriptions of a landscape that is unimaginable now, and I, I can't imagine, if you've, ever, if you've ever tried to grow a baronia and the things die like hens do, they suddenly just flop over and die. It, it's a beautiful plant, baronia. Uh, there are people describing hundreds and hundreds of acres of brown baronia, baronia in the centre of the baronia, just populated with, with um, cycads. Just. And it's gone forever, you never see it again, ever. Well, the big scrub up in northern New South Wales, 92% of old growth forest is gone. So where's the good news? You said there was good news. <laughs> the good news is, the good news is that in things like, the, there's tremendous, there are some absolutely brilliant farmers. Peter Andrews, Peter you mentioned and, him. And, and I've, I've actually found some since, you know, it was too late to get work for them, but they keep bobbing it. There are some marvellous farmers. There's a huge improvement in the way we farm, whether it's no-till farming or no-kill farming or mm. Peter Andrews. Um, um, brilliant idea of understanding the systems that lay underneath the way the landscape worked and restoring those, slowing the movement of water. All these things we just didn't understand at all. Or we were playing too greedy or too desperate to bother about them or to see beyond each year's crop. Um, so there's that out there. There is a much better scientific understanding. And there is something like the response to land care, which I, I, I gather is, they've had their funding cut recently, which just strikes me as, I don't understand that. But that was, uh, land care struck such a chord with farmers that it was a reminder that they actually feel somewhere in their bones that there's something wrong with just taking from the land, that really you've got to be putting something back and regenerating it. If only because you from your own experience, your own observation, you notice that the land is getting exhausted. Mm. Vast parts of Australia is just exhausted. You, ca you can't get anything going there. It's and the story is just repeated over and over and over again. So I think there is a general awareness. It would take, it would take a fantastically insightful and brave government to actually make it the great national project for the next hundred years. Um, and I doubt we'll see such a thing. But it would be a good one if we decided, well, this country will dedicate itself to a hundred years of regeneration with the same energy and effort that went into destroying it for the previous 150 years. That would be really something to hang on to. Because it's a marvellous thing to see 
the way the land can regenerate. You'll, it'll, never, it'll never come back the same, which is the point that Peter Andrews makes. But you can make it work in a similar way. Um, huge effort. But as exciting as anything else that I've heard of that we might do. Thank you very much, Tom Watson. Thanks, Mary.